Welcome to Bankless, where we explore the frontier of internet money and internet finance. This is how to get started, how to get better, and how to front run the opportunity. I'm Ryan Sean Adams. I'm here with David Hoffman, and we're here to help you become more bankless. David, fantastic episode. Brian Quintez is a former commissioner at the CFTC, former, and he just resigned actually the day before we talked to him. This is a very candid conversation and what's going on in regulators' minds, particularly the CFTC with respect to crypto. Just fantastic insights here. This is definitely part of the Bankless series where we try and explore the disposition or the nature of these agencies that regulate the financial world and are all kind of jostling for position with how to deal with the crypto regulation question. Uh, it was actually really uh, fortuitous that Brian had just resigned from the CFTC, so he could probably wait. He was probably a little bit more uh, capable of speaking freely. Uh, and so we were able to pick his brain about like what's it like to take the perception and perspective of the CFTC uh, as it relates to some of the big questions that we have about how crypto is ultimately going to be regulated by the nation state or even if it can at all. Um, uh, we also went through kind of just a, a background of the CFTC and how it came to be and what its role is. Uh, and then, of course, extended that and extrapolated that to crypto. Um, and then and then also just talked about the inherent um, problems, the, the nature of crypto and how it might you know cause a big obstacle for not only the CFTC, but re for regulators at large. If you, if you guys remember our episode with Josh Rosenthal, we talked about how everyone now has a printing press for assets. Uh, how is a an agency going to deal with that? Um, so questions like this were uh, rampant throughout the, the episode. And I overall really enjoyed Brian's very sober and pragmatic uh, responses to all the questions that we had. Yeah, not only pr pragmatic, but also like values aligned. And this mm -hmm. is just another reminder mm -hmm. to people in crypto who think all regulators are evil and like bad and coming out to get us. Like there are some uh, fantastic people in the halls of our government and in uh, the halls of regulators who want many of the same things that we want and value many of the same things. I think uh, Brian is very much to me, we had uh, Hester Peirce from, uh, who's a commissioner of the SEC on Bankless Podcast a few months ago. And I think we were also surprised at how values aligned she was with mm -hmm. um, the crypto mm -hmm. industry. And uh, so is Brian. And I was just uh, amazed to hear that. Like he had just fantastic insights that I think Anybody in this space for the reasons you listeners are in it, we are in this to, to, to go bankless, to disintermediate uh, you know, financial systems, become more self-sovereign, more free. Um, Brian sees all of that. Mm -hmm. And so he had some very candid uh, insights into how these industries work, like the difference between the SEC and the CFTC. Is there a little beef there? I don't know. Uh, it was interesting to get his uh, insights into you know, the, the world of regulators, how they're reacting to crypto. And I think big takeaway for me, David, was um, Brian thinks that there needs to be a balance restored, that we are too uh, much on the side of, of saying no to everything. No, you can't do this. No, did you ask for permission? I'm sorry, you can't do this. We need to swing the pendulum back the other way, and uh, specifically regulators talking about America, but other countries as well, towards being a bit more like pro-innovation, like asking questions like, well, what if we did this? Could we sandbox this? Could we let this experiment run? How can we focus on maybe um, prosecuting the, the fraud and the scammers directly, rather than uh, creating blanket rules and unclear regulations that that harm the entire industry as a whole. So, super aligned, I think, with uh, with our hopes and aspirations. You know, my only regret, David, is that Brian's still not a CFTC commissioner right. because we need people like him in our uh, government bodies, um, fighting the fight that we're fighting uh, only from the inside. Yes, that is very true. It, it is a, a bummer that he is not um, in like, you know, having the, the regulatory power that he does have yet. I'm really excited to see what his future uh, lies because it sounds like he is trying to work his way into the crypto industry. So I don't hate that either. Also, you're totally right. His take about how uh, the permissionless and open nature of crypto as a uh, response, a backlash to the permissioned nature of the alternative financial system, I thought was a really good take. Uh, and I think was probably my, my favorite part in this conversation. So without further ado, I think we should just go ahead and get right into that conversation with Brian Quintez. But first, before we get there, a moment to talk about some of these fantastic sponsors that make the show possible. Bankless is proud to be supported by Uniswap. 
Uniswap is a new paradigm in asset exchange infrastructure. Instead of a cumbersome order book system where trades are matched with other humans, Uniswap is an autonomous piece of software on Ethereum, which is what Ryan and I call a money robot. No human counterparties or centralized intermediaries, just autonomous code on Ethereum. Input the token you want to sell and receive the token you want to buy. Something brand new in the Uniswap ecosystem is the Uniswap Grants program is now accepting applications for grants. We have been saying this for a while and we'll say it again. DAOs have money and they are in need of labor. If you think that you have something to contribute to the Uniswap DAO, apply for a grant to Uniswap. Just look at the size of the Uniswap treasury. It's almost $3 billion. This mountain of capital is looking for labor. Do you have something of value to contribute to the Uniswap DAO? No matter how big or small your idea is, you can apply for a uni grant at unigrants.org and help steer Uniswap in the direction that you think it should go. That's exactly what we did to get Uniswap to be a sponsor for Bankless, and you can do the same for your project. Thank you, Uniswap, for sponsoring Bankless. Balancer is a powerful platform for flexible automated market makers. Typical AMMs just have two tokens inside of one liquidity pool, which can lead to fractured liquidity across the many pairs in DeFi. With Balancer, you can access the full power of multiple tokens inside of one single AMM, which unlocks an entirely new playing field of possibility. This makes Balancer an awesome building block for so many different use cases. Balancer pools can make asset indices, but instead of paying fees to portfolio managers, Balancer lets you collect the fees from traders who use your portfolio for liquidity. Additionally, Balancer smart pools can be programmed to have properties that change according to predetermined rules, such as changing the swap fee based on market conditions, or even liquidity bootstrapping pools, which can help you launch and distribute your token with day one liquidity. At Bankless, we use a liquidity bootstrapping pool to sell our BAP t-shirts to much success. Balancer V2 brings powerful new features that makes your money work even harder for you. In V2, idle tokens are capable of generating yield in DeFi without sacrificing liquidity in the pool using Balancer's asset managers. Balancer's vault architecture lets you trade between Balancer pools at a fraction of the cost versus trading on other platforms. Balancer's mission is to become the primary source of liquidity in DeFi by providing the most flexible and powerful platform for asset management and decentralized exchange. Dive into the balancer pools at app.balancer.fi. Bankless Nation, we are super excited to introduce you to our next guest. This is Brian Quintez. He is a very recently former commissioner at the CFTC, the Commodity and Future Exchange. He was nominated by both presidents, Obama and Trump, unanimously uh, confirmed by the Senate for that position. Before being a commissioner, he used to run his own investment firm. He was an analyst during the banking sector. I think that was his trial by fire because there was a little banking crisis in between there. He ran a, a commodity hedge fund as well. So he's got an experience in Capitol Hill as well as in capital markets. Uh, Brian, it is fantastic to have you on Bankless. How are you doing, sir? Thanks, Ryan. I'm doing great. It's great to be with you and uh, excited to be uh, doing this um, post-government. Yeah, that's cool. So you just resigned uh, recently then. Is that the case? Yeah, that's 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 the case. So uh, as, as a commissioner, um, I and my colleagues are appointed to ca calendar date set terms. And it's a five year term. And technically, mine actually expired last year. Uh, but I could stay on through the end of, of this year unless my replacement had been nominated and confirmed. That didn't happen. So I was basically um, given the choice of when I would want to choose to step down. And, and this felt like the right time. And I'm excited having been at the commission for four years, uh, four full years. I'm excited to take the next step. Well, this is super cool because I think you can uh, get, give us some takes that are maybe not representative of the CFTC now. These are your own kind of personal takes that we'll be exploring this industry. But you have that. Yeah, I don't, have to, I don't have to give my disclaimer anymore. Yeah, it took exactly. me four years That's to remember great. to give my disclaimer. And now I don't have to do it again. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Happy That's to great. talk uh, uh, about my my own my own thinking, you know, free and clear from how it may affect uh, you know anyone's view of the agency. We'll start here, like free and clear. I think what a lot of crypto people are wondering is, does the U.S. government hate us? Does the U.S. government hate crypto? Um, I, I mean, if, you know, I think there's a, a short answer and a longer answer to that. The short answer is that um, it, I think it depends on the time period and uh, the people in positions of authority. Uh, I think the longer answer is that 
we've obviously seen a transition in, in um, political dynamics, in the power structures uh, of the White House and Capitol Hill and in the regulatory community. And those power dynamics uh, have philosophical impacts in terms of a regulatory, regulatory outcome. And um, it, it seems to me like uh, there's, uh, we're in an environment that's much more negative, I think. Um, I, I'm, I'm disappointed to say that. And, and that's not necessarily to put value judgments or um, uh, you know, negative connotations on anybody's, any particular person's motives. So I have uh, plenty of uh, friends that are colleagues that are you know, um, in majority positions now and have been in minority positions. But I mean, you look at, um, as I know you've talked about extensively, you look at you know, what happened with the infrastructure bill, you look at what's coming out of uh, you know, the SEC and, and, and some of the agencies um, you look at you know the language that's being used on Capitol Hill uh, by some very outspoken members of Congress, and um, it's hard not to think that there's a little bit of a target on crypto's back right now. We've been feeling that, Brian. To be honest, I think the infrastructure bill uh, is a, a time in the crypto industry's history where we really felt that significantly. Uh, we've got lots of stuff to talk about, but let, let's park on this for a minute. I'm, I'm curious, why do you think? this has skewed negative recently in the current zeitgeist uh, across regulators, across all of government. Why is this regime maybe we're currently in a bit negative on crypto? So I think, I think it's, I think it's a few reasons. Um, number one, it is, you know, a lot of it is currently outside of the control of regulators and, uh, and, and, and that creates interesting dynamics. For the first it, that dynamic that it creates is that it competes against you know, the regulated environment. And so just, just from a, 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 a fairness perspective, I think it's legitimate to, to kind of ask yourself, if you're in a position that's appointed, that is um, you know, swearing to uphold the law, uh, to, to look at you know, what you regulate and what you can't or don't regulate, and ask yourself, you know, am I creating, you know, fair competition? And I know one of my colleagues has kind of focused on that, you know, at, at my former colleagues have, has focused on that at the agency. Um, I, but I think there's more to it than that. And I think, you know, more to it is um, when you're in a position like a regulator, you're used to having control. You're used to um, expressing uh, some of your political philosophy or your regulatory philosophy through that control and things that are outside of your control that are related to your space, I think, um, you know, challenge that and diminish your authority and diminish your power and diminish, um, uh, you know, uh, what, you, you know, your reach. And I think some of this could be motivated uh, by, you know, the, the, the need to do more, uh, the want to create a, uh, a new uh, regulatory uh, framework and structure uh, that, that is some kind of legacy uh, that is, you know, could be self-serving uh, for, for those in positions of authority. Uh, so, I mean, I think there are a lot of dynamics that are going on um, right now. And, you know, there, there's, there's kind of the traditional fair competition, you know, discussion and you can kind of err on the side of um, innovation and letting the market kind of evolve before you take a you know more of a, a stricter view, uh, or you can err on the side of I need to enforce the law as it is currently written, you know, against anyone who should be caught up by it, regardless of whether or not they fit into this box. Innovation versus like very strict uh, rule rule following, being sort of a stickler for this sort of thing. You know, uh, before we get any farther, Brian, I'm actually interested in your personal take here. So, like, what's your personal take on crypto? Is it is it a good thing? Is it something that um, the U.S. government should kind of push away and and relegate to the fringes of society? What's your take? Well, so you know, th maybe this represents ignorant thinking, you know, or or old fashioned thinking, and you know, that the CFTC is a small agency, and we have authority over a huge market, 400, $400 trillion of derivatives, you know, are traded that is that are within our jurisdiction. That's the biggest affect, market by far of any financial biggest market. market by far. Of course, that's a notional value, sure. uh, you know, uh, uh, measurement. So it doesn't necessarily measure, you know, uh, true risk in terms of dollars, you know, exposed to, to risk. 
but it's but it is a huge market. It affects all areas of the economy uh, for risk management purposes. You know, to ensure risk transfer functions and hedging activity of of, of every sector. And, and we're 750 people, or the agency is 750. I'm not there anymore, right? So the agency was it is 750 people, and so you know it's there, there's a lot to handle. Um, and so I think you know the 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 agency during my time there worked hard at trying to keep on top of of what's going on. Um, and you know my I've worked hard at trying to keep on top of what's going on, but you know it takes about two clicks, you know, through a thread on Twitter to realize that um, there's a lot of stuff going on that I still need to learn more about. So I say that, uh, you know, as a little bit of a caveat to say, you know, maybe this is, is, is over style thinking and we can, you know, talk more about it in real time, you know, if there's more to add. But, you know, I, I think about, you know, crypto is kind of how it evolved. I, I was I, I felt I was very early in my role at the agency to defend the intrinsic inherent value of Bitcoin. Um, you know, Bitcoin was kind of, Bitcoin and, and Ether and, you know, the Ethereum blockchain and the Bitcoin blockchain were kind of the most prominent things in the space, you know, as I was coming into the agency and as I was, you know, nominated for this role and preparing to come into the role. Um, and, you know, at that point, as there still are, uh, there were a lot of value judgments being made, you know, on, uh, what this is, if it has value, whether or not it's a fraud. Um, and, and, you know, I gave, uh, uh, I, I gave speeches in the United States. I gave a speech direct, you know, directed at um, the powers that be in Europe to say, look, you know, I don't know what the value of this is, but there is unquestionable value in it. And to dismiss it, as something that you know is is a fraud or is worthless or is a Ponzi scheme or a bubble misses how I think ninety five percent of the world is going to look at this. We can't look at it at that point through the lens of a reserve currency status of the United States or of the euro or of some other major global currency. We need to look at it through the demand and and accessibility. Uh, with something that has a finite supply in terms of you know, Bitcoin specifically at that point um, and understand that this is something that is going to grow in interest and likely value. And so, you know, I, I felt like I've been consistent about um, uh, the fact that there is inherent value in what we've seen develop, you know, from, from a, a, a crypto token, crypto asset uh, basis. And I've never felt like we needed to necessarily have you know, new regulations for that, that, um, you know, those tokens, you know, were either securities or non-securities. And while we would all possibly like more clarity on what those things, on, on the status of that from the SEC, uh, we didn't necessarily need um, new law, you know, to, to address some of that. I think it was more process as opposed to policy, if that makes some sense. Um, but then as you know, we start getting into DeFi, I think the conversation shifts a little bit in terms of you know, what the CFTC's purview is, because there have been you know, some uh, protocols you know, through you know, smart contracts, uh, native tokens that have allowed for derivative-like contracts to be listed and traded. And that directly implicates the CFTC's jurisdiction. And, and I think you know, that's where you know, we can really talk about, you know, where where I fall on, on the scale of, you know, strictly enforcing the law in real time, regardless of innovation, you know, or the progress uh, of a certain, you know, uh, of a certain space or a certain sector, and regardless of some of the features that, that that space has that doesn't exist in the traditional regulated financial system that solve for some of the problems which regulation was designed to address. You know, or um, you know, taking what I view as more of a of a of a, of a stand back, um, you know, a wait and see approach to see how this space develops, to see how it can address some of these problems through transparency, through open access, how it can promote freedom, how it can promote uh, wealth creation, how it can promote access uh, to um, you know financial uh, uh, products, and then revisit the law and or an agency's regulations, if there is a need, you know, to address some flaw. 
And, you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there are a few, but I don't know of a lot of or, or a huge swath of investors in this space or owners in this space that are raising their hands and say and saying, hey, U.S. government, please come and protect me. I, I need your help. I can't make my own decisions. <laughs> yes, I agree. Please, please make value judgments for me. You know, I, I don't see that anywhere. And I think that that should be, you know, a direct response to anybody uh, on Capitol Hill in agencies uh, that are saying, you know, we care about investor protection and uh, this area is ripe with fraud and and uh, you're at risk unless, you know, we're there to help. Brian, we have so much to talk about and I want to get to this conversation of DeFi and so many things that um, that you mentioned, uh, like feel like American values, you know, DeFi being a representation of American values. So we definitely want to get to that discussion in a little bit, but I'm wondering if you could provide for our listeners a, a quick primer on the CFTC as a regulatory agency. So you, you did that a little bit, 750 employees regulating this this, man, this massive uh, $400 trillion derivatives market, and pretty incredible. And I, I noticed the mission of the CFTC, it says, is to promote the integrity, resilience, and vibrancy of the U.S. derivatives market. Can, can you tell us maybe in uh, some plain speak terms, like what is the purpose and mission of the CFTC? Why are you guys there? How are you guys helping? Yeah, thanks. So I, um, I'll, I'll try to take a little bit of a walk back through time, not to not to bore anybody, but I, I think it's interesting. And I think, you know, it, it actually speaks to um, some of the regulatory and the political uh, environment of the agency and how we interact with Capitol Hill and what you may see going forward and, and why. But, you know, the, the, the U.S. derivatives markets really began in Chicago in the 1850s. And, um, you know, that's, that's where uh, trading occurred, you know, uh, for commodities, you know, for a future delivery at a specific point to allow farmers, transporters, producers, processors to, to manage their risk to manage their risk, so prices going up, prices going down, you know, supply disruptions, weather events, all those kinds of things. And that was a, um, a, a federally unregulated, um, privately self-regulated marketplace through the 1930s, when ultimately, because of some price movements, there was a, a, a political call to create a, an, an agency at that point within the Department of Agriculture because of the uh, birth of the futures markets from the agricultural sector in products like corn, wheat, soybeans, um, uh, you know, to create a regulatory agency within the Department of Agriculture to oversee, you know, the futures exchanges. And, you know, and that was in the 30s. And then fast forward in time and in the 1970s, Congress passed the Commodity Exchange Act, which officially created the CFTC and gave this agency independent status, which meant it wasn't it wasn't part of the administration. And it, it achieved a level of independence by virtue of having a bipartisan multi-member board. Uh, so we have five uh, appointed presidentially nominated and appointed roles, Senate confirmed presidentially nominated and appointed roles. Um, and no one political party can have more than three members. So usually you have two Republicans, two Democrats, and the chair appointed by the president. So the president's party has, you know, um, governing control over the agency. Uh, so that's how the, the agency was originally created. You know, at, you know, through the 80s and 90s, you had the um, invention, the, you know, the innovative development of financial futures. You know, futures contracts on treasuries, futures contracts on on uh, stock indexes, um, which which significantly expanded the agency's jurisdiction from both a number of contracts traded and the markets and what was underlying those markets. Then, because there were you know futures on stocks, there was a you know agreement between the SEC and the CFTC about narrow based you know security futures contracts and you know single name security futures, narrow based security index futures, and broad based security index futures. That's just a little bit of an aside, but it, it can be relevant going forward. Um, then, as we got through the financial crisis, and a in my view, a very tiny corner of the swaps market 
um, played a role, uh, you know, in that through credit default swaps on mortgage-backed securities. You know, if we're talking about a, you know, hundreds of trillions of dollars, of, you know, market, this is, I, I don't know what the numbers are off the top of my head. I'd say probably, you know, two trillion, three trillion, something like that. A big number, big number, but tiny fraction of the swaps market. But Congress responded to that, you know, financial crisis with a whole new regulatory regime for swaps. Uh, and that was implemented through the Dodd-Frank Act. So then that gave the CFTC jurisdiction over interest rate swaps, credit default swaps, equity swaps, commodity swaps, foreign uh, exchange swaps. Uh, you know, that rule writing occurred in the ag- at the agency mostly in the first kind of four years of the 2010s, although we have recently wrapped up a number of very important rules that were left unfinished uh, on things like swap dealer capital, uh, our cross-border view of swap dealing activity, a position limits regime that expanded position limits to new commodity futures contracts. And, um, you know, and that brings us front and center to today when um, I was being nominated for this role and I was preparing to talk about all things Dodd-Frank and the implementation of new swaps market uh, rules. And, you know, within two months of uh, joining the agency and, and, and deciding to sponsor our technology advisory committee, Bitcoin futures get listed by two exchanges and put the agency front and center in the crypto debate. And it's, you know, it's, we haven't looked back since. And I certainly haven't looked back. And I'm, I'm thrilled to, I was thrilled to be a part of the agency when that was happening. Um, and, you know, I can't wait to see uh, where it goes and how I can be involved. It seems like there's one trend, Brian, which is like um, new financial product is created. Something bad happens. Congress reacts. CFTC gets more jurisdiction to come fix it. Uh, but it, it seems to oftentimes start with some bad thing happening in a new financial market, some sort of fraud that's out there. Is this the, the, the so, recipe that's repeating? So um, when I first joined Capitol Hill as a policy staffer, you know, young, right out of college, uh, opening the mail, giving tours of the Capitol building, you know, great stuff, a lot of fun, you know, but, but very introductory. Uh, I remember someone coming into the office who, you know, um, uh, you know, was well known in the office and, and they just said, you know, Brian, I just want you to remember two things. You know, uh, I want you to remember something. Congress is great at doing two things, nothing and overreact. <laughs> and, and, um, and I didn't say that. I'm quoting someone that did say it. So, you know, no one can say that it's my view. But, I'm sure but he I, was quoting someone else, too. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, probably. But but I would I would um, expand upon that or actually rationalize it to say, you know, that you know, at some level, that's what it's supposed to do. You know, I also went to a a class on uh, procedure and process at the Library of Congress, my first, you know, couple weeks at, uh, you know, on Capitol Hill. And, you know, uh, one of the experts in, in congressional procedure and, and the rules that st- are structured to consider bills said, you know, a lot of people get frustrated because they think Congress was created to enact laws. When if you really read the Constitution and think about what the founding fathers had in mind, Congress was created to try to make it as hard as possible to have bad ideas become law. Hmm. And, you know, we can debate about how successful they were, um, hmm. you, know, you know, over the course of time and what's developed. But it is very hard for Congress because of checks and balances, because of, you know, the consensus that's needed, because of how much is on their plate um, and, and how much time it takes to consider just the normal business that they have to do of funding the government every year. Uh, it is very difficult to pass new legislation. And usually there is only, um, you know, momentum necessary to focus the time and the resources and the rule writing and get support for, you know, a product if it's responding to a crisis. And, you know, it, in that kind of scenario, in my view, you're never going to end up with um, a, a rationalized, right-sized, um, you know, uh, scalpel-like or flexible kind of approach or one that distinguishes well between um, things that didn't have anything to do with the crisis or why the crisis happened to begin with. Um, so you're right. And, you know, that, that, that if a crisis happens, Congress usually responds. And depending on who's in power, 
uh, and what their political views are, you know, you're, you're, you could get a you could get a result that's very punitive. Um, luckily, I think for the most part, the, the, the rule writing that the CFTC did, certainly while I was there in the last four years to, to rethink and recalibrate a number of rules that were written in response to the crisis, ha have been done in a way that really respect risk, respect the market, and respect the public. Um, but who knows if a crisis hits the crypto space, what Congress is going to do, who's going to get a new authority, who's going to be at that agency when that authority is given, and what those rules end up looking like. Brian, you just went through and gave us a, a historical context for the establishment and growth of the CFTC. And I just want to add a, a little bit more color upon that, because in the crypto world, we often talk about how we are speed running the evolution of money and finance. And you know, the commodities and the financialization of commodities are just a part of that history as everything else. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and you talked about how the you know, uh, futures contracts came out to help people, help farmers um, manage risk uh, and help ensure that they can you know, perpetuate their farm and, and uh, into the future without having the, um, the whims of the market dictate whether their farm can survive. And so for the people who are you know, crypto native and want to uh, gain a map for how this relates to our industry, like Bitcoin miners are a new age farm, right? This is our new age yield uh, with like new age crops. We call these ASICs. Uh, they're producing digital commodities rather than physical commodities. And also, we also have this term in, in DeFi called yield farming. Uh, and like that term is appropriate. Like these are people with like, you know, digital crops and digital yields that will need financial tooling that we have already created in the physical world. And now crypto is going to overlay these things, these instruments that we've had and had before that the CFTC has a jurisdiction over. We're going to overlay them onto all these things that we're creating in, in DeFi. And so that's really where this conversation uh, between the crypto and CFTC really begins. Uh, it, we've seen this before, uh, but now we are putting it onto a digital paradigm. Uh, and we all have to come to terms with like what that means and what the similarities are and what the differences are. Um, I just wanted to add that color and see if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, it, it should have been really self-evident to me to think about, you know, mining as the new farming. Uh, and, you know, given that, you know, some of those terms are, are being used, uh, it, you know, in the space. And I think it's it's a great way, way to think about it. And I think it directly applies to, you know, our legacy space and what we're going to see in the future. You know, the, the most successful businesses are the ones that successfully risk manage. and um, and they do that through a combination of, you know, of tactics, but derivative use is a part of that. And I think, you know, one of the most irresponsible things I've ever heard someone say about the derivatives markets is that they're weapons of mass destruction. You know, they are the reason why we have had economic growth that we have had for the last 30 to 40 years, period. You know, and anyone saying something like that is trying to sell you something. Um, and, 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 um, you know, it's it's really unfortunate that that kind of view, um, you know, was aired and and painted with you know whole cloth the entire space. Um, but derivatives are crucial to risk management. I think the agency has done a very good job of um, of regulating the risk involved. Although you know the the reason that um, we have the regulatory system that we do, you know, for futures and swaps contracts is because you know the one one ph philosophical take on the agency's goal is to protect the integrity of a transaction you know that you know because of the use of margin you know which which is which is um, you know viewed as as basically kind of like a um, performance bond you know it's not it's not a down payment it's kind of viewed as a performance bond that you will you know, make good on the need to pay up if the contract moves against you. Um, that does that creates leverage, but it, it's necessary because no one's going to put up all of the money for you know a product because otherwise it's a pre-sale you know or a pre-purchase. So that's not really a risk. It is a risk management tool, but it's not the same kind of risk management tool. So you know, uh, uh, derivatives hedging naturally involves leverage. Leverage creates risks. It creates risks of default by a customer, which can create the risk, you know, to a clearing entity that is designed to stand in the middle of each trade and, and break that trade apart and face each side 
so that something diversifies the risk of customer defaults by aggregating it together. You know, clearing houses don't reduce risk. They, they try to diversify it through aggregation. Um, and you have clearing members, which are the financial firms that are the brokers of um, derivatives contracts. We call them future commission merchants, FCMs. But you can see a scenario where a you know, customer through a, a very adverse market event uh, can't make good, um, goes bankrupt, that the size of that position is big enough that it affects the FCM. The FCM can't make good on its obligations to the clearinghouse. Uh, maybe a few FCMs are caught in this, and all of a sudden there's a massive problem at the clearinghouse, and everything everyone has been using for risk management purposes is gone. You know, I mean, that's that's a debacle. Now, I, I don't think that there's a lot of stress testing that we do of clearing houses. They are incredibly resilient, incredibly resilient. I mean, we're talking multiples of a Lehman style event, multiples of a COVID style market move, you know, that could even start to approach some of the reserve resources they have. I mean, very resilient. Um, but in my view, you know, you're not going to threaten a clearinghouse unless there is broad financial economic chaos. And, you know, and that may be the, one of the le lesser problems that you have in that kind of scenario. But, you know, I say all of that to, to describe the rationale for why we regulate the way we have, why the CFTC has regulated the way it does. And it's to protect the integrity of the transaction because of leverage and because of how that leverage can flow through the system. Now, when you have a new financial paradigm that's been, you know, uh, rapidly and, and wonderfully developed in, you know, the last two, three, four, five years of DeFi, um, you know, you, you have kind of a whole different approach to that. You have a different approach to risk management. You have a different view of, of counterparty exposure. You have a different view of what you need to, you know, what, what deserves protecting from a, from a risk management perspective and whether or not, you know, protocols that have more open source code that can be viewed and, and are actually probably much more transparent than, you know, the changing margining process of the legacy clearinghouses. You know, that's just a completely different dynamic dynamic. And, you know, right now, the law in our rule set says if you trade a futures contract, it has to be done on a registered exchange and cleared through a clearinghouse. Well, you know, maybe before we start, you know, punitively going after, you know, DeFi developers and, and market participants that aren't complaining about anything, we should think whether or not that's the right approach, you know, for this kind of market. And um, again, I think there are some very thoughtful people, uh, even, even, you know, that, that may take a different view of me from, you know, the innovation to the fair competition landscape, um, uh, you know, very thoughtful people uh, that I think have, have the best intentions. But I think we need to, uh, my view is, and my view was in that role before, we need to be thoughtful about what's different. Yeah, totally agree. And the, no question about um, DeFi bringing an entirely new paradigm, a more uh, a disintermediated paradigm to the entire legislative like set of laws and set of regulations that are on the books. You know, you know and, and Ryan, let me pick up on that if I could oh, for a yeah, second. Yeah, go for uh, it. Uh, because, you know, I, I, I was listening um, to, to your podcast, Ryan Selkis, and was talking about the, you know, the political dynamic. Yeah, he's fired up, recently. isn't he? <laughs> he is fired up. And, and I spoke with him recently, and, and it was a great conversation. And, you know, I think... He, um, he provided, you know, a lot of clarity, you know, in, in some of his comments. Some, some of them I, I disagreed with, uh, but, but I think, you know, as I think about the, the, the progress that the crypto space has seen in political advocacy, you know, the voice that it has, the, the, you know, unification around an idea of, you know, no, understand this before you um, attack it. And, you know, hey, we're good. We might not need your protection. To me, you know, those those kinds of, uh, you know, the, the unity around those ideas, you know, it might be coming from the fact that the space is disintermediated, that there isn't there aren't very large intermediaries that can create a conflict between, you know, cust uh, uh, with their customers you know, where customers can feel taken advantage of or can feel powerless. I mean, you compare it to the traditional banking system. I mean, 
you know, the, the, the customers of some of the banks are the, you know, give them the worst reviews, but yet they don't change banks. You know, I mean, customer satisfaction is very, very low in the traditional banking space. And that, to me, creates a fractured political dynamic where you can try to promote, um, you know, economies of scale and, you know, and, and a capitalist system and the benefits there, while also, you know, uh, the the risk of um, you know cu- adversarial customer base that really does want you know someone to take it out of you know you know the entities that they feel are you know abusing them and you know there are there are uh, receptive audiences to both of those perspectives on Capitol Hill and that creates you know a dynamic of well. Um, you know, which one are we going to listen to and, and which, which philosophy is in power at what point to create a, you know, more, you know, uh, uh, laissez-faire regime versus a more, um, you know, customer protection and control regime. But in this, in this space, you don't necessarily have that kind of conflict. And you have a, a again, more of a, um, uh, a sense of self-responsibility self-direction, self-education, uh, individual freedom, individual liberty, taking ownership for your decision-making. And it's, and it's basically saying, hey, we're good. You know, we don't need you. And I think that's a, an incredibly powerful thing to try to preserve going forward. 125% agree with you on this, Brian. And I've, I've never heard somebody, you know, coming out of the, the, the regulatory world, um, you know, frame it in that way. But that's exactly what crypto is saying. You know how you were saying earlier, uh, co- Congress does two things, either nothing or overreacts. And then we were talking about this. To say you quoted I someone, say excuse me, <laughs> <laughs> quoted a, someone who quoted someone. Um, and we were talking earlier about this pattern of, um, you know, kind of regulation, how there's new financial product, there's a crisis, Congress responds, and then it overreacts and, you know, lots of things happen. The, what crypto is saying is like, hey, guys, we haven't had a crisis, right? Like, you're attacking us, and there's nothing wrong here. We're actually building something that's incredibly cool. It's $2 trillion. And some of the biggest crypto companies and organizations and employers behind this movement are actually U.S.-based. And so, like, shouldn't America be supporting something that, A, aligns with American values, and like B helps to propagate and and uh, you know increase the pie of the American economy and employ more people. Like, come on, take a look at this industry. We're not causing a crisis here. In fact, when you when you peer into the, all the weirdness of the code and the memes, everything that goes on in, on Twitter, uh, you'll find some pretty robust financial products. And by the way, if you don't believe us, it's all transparent and open. So go check the blockchain, right? Like. Um, this is kind of what we're saying, and I think you're saying the same thing. And I, 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 I totally am, and I think it, you know it's a great conversation that leads to, you know, but my, you know my view of how you know aspects of DeFi really represent the founding principles of this country, which is individual liberty and freedom. And you know, Chris John Carlo, uh, you know, a, a previous chairman of the CFTC, with whom I'm very close and. Uh, was a wonderful chair and has been doing wonderful th- things in this space. The original crypto yeah, dad, I think Twitter gave me yeah, that. Yeah, crypto dad, that, that's <laughs> right. Um, it was great to be at the commission all, while all that was going on. You know, uh, he had to turn off his phone as his Twitter followers, you know, went from uh, basically 100 to 50,000. Uh, but it, 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 it well-deserved. I mean, he's a very thoughtful person. I mean, he, he, he said in a speech, the freedom to transact in the financial marketplace is part of freedom itself. And, you know, I think we need to take a step back in this country and ask ourselves, you know, uh, how much freedom are we really giving up? And is it for the right purpose? Is it for the right benefit? You know, the, the I'm a big believer in balance. Uh, you know, I think I think, um, you know, th- there, there are rational arguments on both sides of a spectrum between, um, you know, ensuring things you know aren't used illicitly versus ensuring that people can do what they want and are free to transact with privacy. But I believe that the pendulum has, has swung very far, you know, in one direction of anti-privacy and pro-surveillance, that we need to have a reset and a rethink of that conversation. And I think, you know, the only way to do it 
and you, you kind of see, you know, in an ecosystem, when it gets out of balance, it's usually something that's in the other extreme that comes along that resets. Yep. You know, to me, that's that's DeFi. You know, that's crypto. You know, that's um, that's that's some aspects of of what we've seen. Is it is it's it's the it's innovative innovation um, that is responding to something getting way out of balance. And I think no one's going to argue that that we don't want, you know, terrorists to be using, you know, things that uh, could cause harm to people. But, you know, that doesn't mean that the government should be able to see every single transaction I do um, and that crypto shouldn't be uh, viewed more along the lines of physical cash. Um, and even with you know, um, AML uh, and and terrorist financing concerns, you know, I would think that is it's in the U.S.'s, you know, uh, geopolitical, you know, uh, uh, national strategic interest to allow citizens of foreign countries where some terrorist organizations are based to be transacting in these things to try to create more independence from those regimes. And so walling those, you know, those countries off from, you know, the innovation and the wealth creation, um, you know, of these things, you know, just for the sake of, of, of you know, a, a, a justified fear, you know, of how some may use it, you know, could be doing plenty of harm that needs to be considered in, you know, uh, how, how we view um, the progress that people around the uh, world can make to escape authoritarian uh, dictatorships. And, you know, that's the foreign policy aspect. I mean, there's the domestic aspect. Um, I, I think it just requires, it's going to require a new conversation. And I think um, uh, the laws on the books are the laws on the books and the interpretations are the interpretations. But, um, you know, we need to do a better job of, of swinging the pendulum back. Totally agree with that. Um... Brian, I want to ask you about kind of uh, some differences that might be in the mind of, of a listener as they're thinking about the CFTC jurisdiction and, and kind of SEC. And um, you know, both organizations, regulators have played a role in, in that. Um, recently, uh, there have been sort of a, a new SEC chair, Gary Gensler, taking charge, and he's communicated some things that the crypto industry is just kind of like unsure of the clarity still hasn't come out of the sec with respect to its position on basic things like what's a security versus what's a commodity uh you tweeted this out on august 4th just so we're all clear here the sec has no authority over pure commodities or their trading venues whether those commodities are wheat gold oil dot 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 or crypto assets i'm, cu- I'm curious about this um what in crypto is clearly a commodity versus what is clearly a security like we still don't have a solid answer to that um is bitcoin a commodity i think the cftc has said yes is ether a commodity i think the cftc has said yes i don't know if you can confirm that and then like what about all of these other assets because we have now hundreds of thousands of them and we don't know what regulatory regime they even fall under. Can you shed some light on this? Yeah, I, I, I can try. Uh, and, you know, let me ju- let me just say that, you know, that the, the tweet that you showed was um, in response to a speech that Chairman Gensler gave at the Aspen Security Forum, where he characterized crypto as the Wild West with rampant fraud that needed protection oversight and he was going to use as many authorities as he could to provide that, as well as asking Congress for new authorities to do it. I recall the speech. Um, uh, yeah, um, I was I was very disappointed in some of the reporting of that speech, as well as in the la- in my view the purposeful lack of clarity um, or, or or omission of certain facts, given Chairman Gensler's chairmanship over the CFTC during and after Dodd-Frank, when the CFTC was given new authority over fraud and manipulation um, issues in spot market commodity transactions. Spot market commodity transactions are just, you know, cash for commodity. 
you know, go, going to the store, buying something, spot market, you know, commodity transaction. Um, and that is authority that the CFTC has had and reporters know it and the leadership of the SEC knows it. And a lot of people in the space know it. It's authority we've used that the agency has used. I think we've brought, brought 25 to 30 cases over the last couple of years prosecuting fraudsters who are offering you know, exposure to crypto or a new crypto token and just absconded with people's money. Um, we have you know, uh, fine, received civil penalties, um, disgorgement, uh, and, and you know, other you know, f- financial uh, related penalties to the tunes of, I think, over $100 million, you know, maybe $200-ish million. So um, you know, the CFTC has been very active you know, in this space. And again, with, you know, with a, within a small agency, 750 people full time that are, you know, charged with protecting and overseeing and promoting the integrity resilience of, you know, the entire derivatives markets. And, you know, I was disappointed that, that our role in promoting that market integrity and holding fraudsters accountable was not raised either in that speech or in um, the press. And I was disappointed that uh, there wasn't um, more subtlety to what current authorities, you know, the limitations of current authorities are uh, around pure commodity transactions wherever they are traded versus, you know, what Congress may or may not choose to do. And if they choose to do something, who should be the correct, um, uh, you know, agency to try to implement that regime? And so, you know, it's... uh, um, I, I think there's. I think this is part of a longer story. Um, and again, my view is that there isn't, you know, a groundswell of support uh, in in the crypto space for, um, n- n- you know, needing the protection of the government. Uh, people are taking individual responsibility and doing their own research and uh, expressing, in my view, you know, their um, their rights to freedom of uh, financial market transactions in this space. But I think, you know, to your point, it is not the CFTC that determines if something is a security. Hmm. Under our statute, under the Commodity Exchange Act, basically anything that can be bought and sold in interstate commerce that has some level of fungibility is a commodity. So we don't, as an agency, we don't have to make really, you know, an affirmative declaration that this is a commodity. Basically, you should assume that that basically everything's a commodity. You know, so so then the question is, is that commodity also a security? You know, does that commodity also you know represent a security? And if so, it goes into the SEC's purview. Okay, okay. so from the CFTC's perspective, you're saying all crypto assets that are out there are commodities, and it's outside I think of it gets your a little jurisdiction. Strange. I just want to clarify that real okay. quick. I think it's a little strange when you start talking about NFTs. Yeah, because, okay. I was going to ask, you know, like, what's I mean, NFTs? Is that a, what is that? Know, I, I think it depends on on how many of a of a similar kind of you know of NFT are created. But if they are, you know, if they are somewhat unique and they're highly limited, or there is a lack of fungibility, you know, you know, true fungibility from one to the next, then then that wouldn't necessarily mean that they are commodity. Okay, so, so that could some, be an exception. Some NFTs may not be commodities. Some probably are, but anything that is fungible, so any ERC twenty token, from from the CFTC's perspective, that's a commodity. Uh, now, whether it's also a security or not, that's beyond the jurisdiction of the CFTC, and that starts to fall into SEC territory, and then they have their own tests that um, they apply with limited clarity. I would say on whether something is. A also a um, a security, and so we kind right. of know that Bitcoin and ETH are commodities. I, at least I think we know that because Ether is on the CME right now, CME futures, correct? So okay, so this is an important point. Um, the SEC is going to be the agency that that um, uh, declares or through a you know court challenge. Uh, you know, prevails in classifying something as a security commodity. Okay. And if they do that, 
that security product, you know, it, it, you know, in, in our, in my language, a spot commodity, but that security product has to be traded on an SEC regulated exchange or uh, ATS, alternative trading system. Right, which was a regist- huge registration, you know, regime. Um, if something is not a security, if it's just a commodity, it can be freely traded because there is no federal regime, registration regime for spot commodity trading venues. Uh, there are some state regimes around money transmission, right, which I think you're probably familiar with, with the discussion over you know the last three to four or five years. But where the CFTC becomes involved is if a um, if a registered exchange seeks to list a derivative on a crypto asset, and if that crypto asset is viewed as a security by the SEC, then that futures contract actually has some joint jurisdiction between the agencies. If there isn't a view. At, at that point or, uh, um, you know, going forward, that the underlying product, the underlying asset, that crypto token, isn't a security, then that futures contract is solely within the CFTC's purview. So the fact that you have Bitcoin futures contracts and Ether futures contracts trading within solely within the CFTC's purview means that at least up until now, the SEC has not viewed or declared those to be securities. In my view, that's absolutely appropriate. Um, and I said, I think in March of 2018, that echoed a lot of prior thinking, including then Chairman Christian Carlo, that at that point, Bitcoin was clearly a non-security commodity. And um, uh, recently, uh, Chairman Heath Tarbert, former Chairman Heath Tarbert of the CFTC, declared Ether to be a commodity itself. And he didn't necessarily say a non-security commodity, but my view from within the agency and, and looking back on that was that he wouldn't have made that declaration you know, without you know, some level of uh, communication or awareness uh, that, you know, uh, uh, of how the SEC uh, looked at that. Um, so, you know, then the question is, well, um, you know, should, should you, should, should exchanges try to list a lot of futures contracts on a lot of these products to clarify what their status is? Hmm. Well, yeah. I mean, at least that's, that's, you know, kind of, you know, you know, some idea. Um, and in that circumstance, I think you have to be careful what you wish for. Because there wouldn't be anything to prevent the SEC, and and you know this is their jurisdiction. These are decisions that they make on a regular basis, and they, you know, they are they have a lot of institutional knowledge in applying securities laws. You know, and if if they do that too aggressively, hopefully, you know, someone sees through a court case uh, to its completion and allows a judge to decide as opposing to, you know, enter into a settlement that doesn't necessarily add a lot of clarity to the space. But, you know, if if there were a flood of futures contracts on a number of crypto tokens, there's nothing that would prevent the SEC from saying we think all of those are securities. And then that creates a broader implication of, well, does that mean anyone, you know, that's running a, you know, crypto spot crypto exchange is violating the law? because they're listing these products that the SEC now views as securities. But then you can, you can take that a step further and say to yourself, well, what if we have you know, two kind of you know, competing spot crypto exchanges that each apply you know, for, um, or, or maybe you know, where one applies for you know, a derivatives license with the CFTC. And what if it tried to list a futures contract on its competitors, you know, native token or rewards token? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you know, it's basically using an anti-competition tactic, you know, through, you know, forcing, you know, a regulatory agency to potentially, you know, classify something um, that's in, you know, their competitive interest just by virtue of, you know, the regulatory process. 
And I go through all of that to say, um, we're, I think we're at a point where these decisions need more transparency. Hmm. Um, there, is a, there is a bill that was uh, authored and sponsored by um, Congressman McHenry of North Carolina in the House. It passed the House uh, that called to create a, a, you know, a working group between the SEC and the CFTC and private market participants to discuss and try to clarify the status of a number of these tokens. Um, and I think that's an interesting step. If it were to come to fruition, I don't know what the result would be. You know, I think that the SEC may just do a lot of listening and say, thanks, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll let you know what we think. And it, as is now, I think they're, they're right. And, you know, and within their regulatory, you know, jurisdiction. But I think it speaks volumes. First of all, you know, having served in the House of Representatives for seven years, you know, the, the, the House is run purely on a majority basis, and it is a highly political, you know, um, chamber of, uh, of, of, of Congress. You know, the majority and the power of the speaker is, is pretty unparalleled. And I'm not making a value judgment on any speaker or the current speaker or any prior speaker. That is just institutionally how the House of Representatives is run. And to have a bill, in my view, that that directly implicates or challenges uh, or acknowledges the lack of transparency around these decisions and calls for um, a new process, either out of frustration um, or, you know, to some to some degree, um, uh, you know, indictment. You know, of 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 that lack of that process of that lack of clarity, um, to have a bill pass from a minority member, you know, who has a prominent role as the ranking member of the House Financial Services Committee, you know, pass in a Democrat-controlled House, to me speaks, you know, fairly significantly to a you know a, a view within at least one chamber that this isn't. You know, this is unacceptable, but this needs to change. And I don't necessarily know, you know, if it's if it's not that bill, what the right approach is. Um, you know, I think I think the 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 dialogue between the agencies around the status of something, if there's a futures contract or Druder's contract, you know, listed on it. You know, I think that deserves more transparency. Um, I don't, you know, it, it, and having served in this role, I'm also, you know, selfishly a little bit of a defender of the deliberative privilege. You know, a, a lot of my internal communications are protected by deliberative privilege because it's me forming opinions with own, within my own staff. And I think that, you know, there, there's, there is the need to try to have free and open communications in a, you know, a small, close-knit, you know, office so that exchanges of views can be heard and you don't necessarily you know, overly weaken yourself, you know, in trying to make a decision and then having conviction. But to the extent that there are two agencies that have views about a product that have widespread implications, you know, I don't believe that those communications necessarily should be outside of the public sphere, regardless of whether or not they weaken one agency or the other in terms of potential, you know, uh, uh, legal challenges to what they do. Brian, there's a lot to like parse apart uh, with this, and and the the last what you've you've been saying has been I think illustrative of what a lot of people in the crypto world kind of just want to turn off, right? There's a lot of things to pay attention to when we have all these agencies that are like trying to find the line between these two things, and one of the reasons why we like tokens in in the world of Ethereum and on and on DeFi is that these tokens themselves transcend all like previous categories and boundaries that we've been able to establish from like the the pre-crypto world um like we have tokens that can literally be anything and so they will be everything and all agencies will want to have their sort of like jurisdiction imposed upon these things uh and so like because there's this lack of classification on on tokens it leaves a lot of interpretation as to like what the responsibilities and, and roles of these different regulators are, actually are. Um, but it kind of also leaves a power vacuum 
right? Because there is no classification. And so one, things that we're, one thing that we're worried about or pessimistic on from the world of crypto is that all agencies that have any sort of relevant uh, jurisdiction is, are going to like claim territory. And this is kind of like the, the libertarian versus like the, the statist approach, right? Like uh, people, especially Bitcoiners love this narrative is that like all governmental organizations are incentivized to grow their jurisdiction and to grow their organization. And so ultimately that comes to envelop everything around it uh, and then all of a sudden we've lost the freedoms that we also value in, in the crypto world. So my, my question to you is, is there actually a fight for jurisdiction over stuff like this? And it, do you see that the like the, the budding heads of the CFTC versus the SEC and now also the Treasury, do you see that as like a, a, them trying to jostle for position to have more power and control and, and to, um, you know, perhaps even straight up increase the funding towards their own organization? Uh, so, I mean, yeah, yes and no. Uh, you know, I think if, you know, if, if you approach your role within government, you know, e either from a, you know, uh, uh, a government employee perspective or a leadership perspective or even an appointed perspective, you do owe some allegiance, a significant allegiance, you know, to the law. You know, it, 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 it's a hard thing to look at the law. And if it says X to say, I don't care, you know, when you're in that kind of role, you know, it's just it, it's it, it, there's a lot of irresponsibility, you know, that 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 that, that view could could generate. Um, you know, so I think if there are things that feel to, you know, an institutionalist, you know, uh, an agency representative who has expertise that, yes, this is clearly in our jurisdiction. And if we didn't express that view, we wouldn't be applying the law, you know, fairly and equally. Um, you know, I think that I think that that's, you know, to some degree, you know, what, you know, what, what some of this activity is, uh, you know, on behalf of, of all kind of, you know, counterparts uh, and, and agencies, you know, looking at this space. I think there's a different conversation about, you know, things that may not be within their jurisdiction, within any agency's jurisdiction, that they either, again, view as a threat to their own powers and their own control, either through um, taxation, through uh, money supply, uh, through, um, you know, quote unquote, investor protection issues that then they are trying to find flexibilities in their authorities to bring them into their jurisdiction, or they are asking Congress or hoping that Congress, you know, creates a new regime to give them that jurisdiction. And I believe that's a high bar. I think that, that, that there needs to be a high bar to Congress creating a new regulatory apparatus out of whole cloth that it has not done before. I mean, we do not have a federal oversight regime over purely spot commodity transactions. You know, we don't have we don't register, you know, cattle auctions in Texas and Oklahoma. You know, we, we don't we don't have a federal regulator over eBay, right? In terms of an exchange, you know, the money transmission aspect probably. Um, but why is this so different, and why does it need this kind of attention? Um, to me, that's there's a high bar to justifying, you know, new public policy uh, for any regulator, and I have not seen anyone convincingly state that, uh, including all of the speeches and dialogue that has so far been presented. Gemini is the world's most trusted cryptocurrency exchange. I've been a customer of Gemini since I first got into crypto in 2017, and it's been my main exchange of choice to make my crypto buys and sells. Gemini is available in all 50 states and in over 50 countries worldwide. And on Gemini, there are markets for over 30 various different crypto assets, including many of the hot DeFi tokens. And it's one of the few exchanges that has liquid die markets. Gemini just launched their earn program where you can earn up to 7.4% interest on 26 various crypto assets. If you're tired of paying fees in DeFi or you don't want to worry about DeFi exploits, but you still want to earn interest on your crypto assets, Gemini Earn is the product for you. 
Another product I'm stoked to get my hands on is the Gemini Crypto Back Credit Card, which gives you 3% cash back on all of your purchases, but paid to you in your preferred crypto asset. When I get my Gemini credit card, I'm going to make sure that I get my cash back in ETH. So whenever I buy something, I get a little bit of ETH bonus back to me at the same time. You can open up a free account in under three minutes at gemini.com slash go bankless. And if you trade more than $100 within the first 30 days after sign up, you'll be gifted a free $15 Bitcoin bonus. Check them out at gemini.com slash go bankless. The Aave protocol is a decentralized liquidity protocol on Ethereum, which allows users to supply and borrow certain crypto assets. Aave version 2 has a ton of cool features that makes using the Aave protocol even more powerful. With Aave, you can leverage the full power of DeFi money Legos, yield, and composability all in one application. On Aave, there are a ton of assets that you can supply to the protocol in order to gain yield, and all of those same assets can also be borrowed from the protocol if you have supplied collateral. Here you can see me borrowing 200 USDC against my portfolio of a number of different DeFi tokens in ETH. I'll choose a variable interest rate because it's a lower rate than the stable interest rate option, but I could choose the stable interest rate option if I wanted to lock in that interest rate in permanently. V2 also features the ability for users to swap collateral without having to withdraw their assets, trade them on Uniswap, and then deposit them back into Aave. With Aave, users can do this in one seamless transaction, saving you time and gas costs. Check out the power of Aave at Aave.com. That's A-A-V-E dot com. Brian, I want to spend the rest of our time here uh, talking about this this new paradigm that we maybe introduced earlier in this conversation. That is DeFi, right? So we talked about this world that I think the the current financial of regulatory apparatus is set up for is is a world full of intermediaries. But but DeFi sort of disintermediates the intermediaries. So instead of institutions that that you know take funds. We have code that actually takes uh, funds, and that's open and uh, transparent on on chain. And I want to maybe contrast. Let's kick off this discussion to to ask um, you about kind of the you know the CFTC and how it sees things, and maybe other broader parties in, in government, right? So, the CFTC brought some action against um, Bitmex uh, recently, right? And so, not not to zone in on that action specifically, but. This is the example of what on the bank list we call kind of a crypto bank. This is a centralized exchange, an intermediary, sort of an institution you'd find in traditional finance. And I feel like from my perspective, it's just like, okay, it checks all the boxes. This is just another institution that we regulate like all of the others. Okay, the CFTC knows what to do here. Are they breaking laws? Are they not? If they are, then we have to um, you know, pre prevent fraud. So, okay, I get that. But now we've got this thing, which is DeFi. And it is permissionless, it is global, it is open. There are no counterparties, there's no BitMEX. It, it's executed by code, not humans. And I guess my question to you is, when, when we talk about DeFi, does the CFTC, do you think, and do other regulators see the distinction between those things? Because we've got crypto through crypto banks and intermediaries, but then we have DeFi, which is executed by code, and these are completely different worlds. And I'm not sure how many people understand the subtleties of this difference, but it's massively important. I, I, I totally agree with you. And, uh, you know, and again, I mean, I'm not sure I understand all the subtleties. I think there are a lot of subtleties uh, to it, and it's in a very fast and evolving space. Um, but there are enough differences that I do understand to feel a lot of conviction in saying, the, the old model probably doesn't work. Hmm. And if the old model doesn't work, you know, why should we be trying to apply it and rope someone into it because they published code or because they chose to use something? Um, you know, again, but, you know, as as I've said before um, in a different discussion, just as a matter of fact, not because it's a view that I love, but, you know, the CEA, the Commodity Exchange Act, the law says it is illegal to offer or enter into an off exchange futures contract. Hmm. And I mean, that's the law. Um, and so, you know, if, and, if and just to be clear, Brian, whether that's a, um, the law says as like just the black and white words of the law, it's whether that's a centralized intermediary or a, a smart contract executing that futures contract. Um, it's, it's just a law that pertains to the contract itself. 
is what you're saying. Well, so, so, I mean, I think that, you know, I'm not a lawyer and I'm, I'm very glad I'm not a lawyer. Uh, you know, the agency <laughs> has plenty of lawyers uh, and they do great work. Uh, and, but I'm glad that my voice was a little bit differentiated from theirs. And I'm glad that, you know, not being a lawyer, sometimes I, I felt like I could take, you know, a, a higher level view and ask questions uh, that, you know, maybe someone more focused on the details wouldn't have asked. And so, you know, I, I, I say that to say that, you know, I, I, this isn't legal advice since I'm not a lawyer, thank goodness. But, uh, you know, I guess you could look at the operative words in that statute as, as being, you know, to offer or to enter into, which, you know, could mean, you know, some entity offering something. So it could be, you know, a centralized entity or it could be something else that may be hard to hold accountable for something. But then the other, you know, word is enter into, which actually creates liability for an individual, you know, um, taking responsibility and, um, you know, and, and again, exercising, you know, a financial market freedom by, you know, entering into a transaction. Uh, and, and I think that's a, a, that's an unfortunate and dangerous concept. And one of my points on that was, look, let's take let's take the CFTC out of it. Let's say the CFTC just refused to enforce that that part of the law. You know, large financial institutions are not going to engage in activity that they know is illegal. And so, you know, if the DeFi community, if 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 De the DeFi space and certain, you know, protocols and their smart contracts, you know, are hoping for more institutional engagement, and there are, you know, derivatives being traded, and and there's there's a hope or a wish that you know institutional money or resources come into that, you know, that's a that's gonna that's a problem that's gonna need to be solved. You know, either by changing the law, you know, creating a different kind of framework that can recognize, you know, the status of a non-entity, you know, code, you know, as a exchange, you know, or some other kind of solution. Uh, so there is a real world implication to what the law says, even if the CFTC decides to do nothing. And, and I think that's important to understand. Um, but, you know, but also, you know, to, to your more fundamental question, Brian, um, you know, I, I think that, you know there could be a view by some at the agency. I haven't heard about it directly, but I can understand if some had this view that they saw activity occurring that they believed is illegal, and they're going to find someone to hold accountable for. You know, um, I, I wouldn't agree with that. And that's not something that I would necessarily, you know, overtly kind of support if I had, you know, if I was in my prior role. But, you know, people could take that view, you know, within within, you know, within the regulator. Um, Ryan, uh, I want to want to jump on that point and, and uh, ask another question that's related to that. Um, yeah. when, when I got into uh, crypto, uh, I was how old was I? I was young. I was like 24, 25 or something. Uh, and I had, <laughs> I, had, well, I had a psych, I, so I had a psych degree, right? I didn't have a business degree, didn't have a finance degree. Uh, I paid my taxes with TurboTax, um, whatever, just like input my W2, called it good. Uh, and so many people are coming into crypto with that background, right? Like not really understanding finance, not really understanding, like not even understanding like commodities or securities or anything. You just, you, you got a ledger, you live at your parents' house, uh, you find this Ethereum thing, and then you start pressing some buttons. Uh, and so like one of those buttons might be to mint a commodity or, or a derivative token or something that falls under the regulation of the CFTC. Now, if it's not going to be a centralized intermediary because these individuals are playing around in DeFi and the, the reporting requirements or the, the regulation requirements actually don't fall upon e everyone, uh, does that mean that it actually falls upon the individual to understand the rules and regulations coming out of the CFTC? And do, you, and do you think that the CFTC will actually start to have a uh, jurisdiction over the individual, right? Like, no, you actually can't touch that contract because of the laws. Is that a, like a future that you see or is that just too, too crazy? I, I don't see that future. And I think that would be very irresponsible of the agency to take that view. You know, um, technically, could there be liability there? Yes. But... 
uh, I, I don't view it as as credible um, or as responsible. Um, I mean, I think you really see the agency, you know, only going after individual traders who are, you know, committing massive manipulation, you know, in, in important markets that are bread and butter to the CFTC's jurisdiction. And those cases take a lot of research and a lot of time to bring and win. Um, and, you know, I, I don't I don't see that as as a uh, again, this isn't legal advice, but I don't see that as a as a likely outcome in this space. And it wouldn't be something that I individually would be concerned about me personally. Um, you know, I, I think. Uh, it's. I mean, we're just we're just going to have to see how how. How the space evolves, I, I think that. Um, you know, there is an understanding that, um, you know, publishing code is a First Amendment right and uh, it is it is part of freedom of speech. And uh, there are a lot of court cases, you know, that 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 back up the ability to publish something that could be used by, you know, any you know recipient, you know, in a in a negative, hostile, uh, violent you know, right-breaking way, but it is not the publishing, uh, you know, of that material that is uh, violative of the law. It is the use of it, you know, for that illicit purpose. Um, and I think the, the more that, you know, that DeFi stays or, or, or uh, furthers itself as decentralized, uh, the, 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 the safer, um, you know, uh, the ecosystem is because it basically just becomes individual actors interacting with uh, freely published code. I, 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 I definitely appreciate think that's that take a good too. thing, and I think that I think that's a, I think that represents a lot of hallmarks. You know, and again, the, you know, some of the foundational principles of the, of, of the country. Yeah, that's that's a really really good thing to hear. And I also want to ask because the other uh, obstacle that I, I see coming. Uh, towards the way of regulators and especially the CFTCs. You know, earlier we talked about NFTs and how, like, you know, NFTs could not be synthetic assets or, or uh, commodities or, or anything. But the thing about DeFi is that we have all these financial tools that plug into each other. And so we, we actually just, uh, yet, just yesterday, um, a, a report, uh, a new project came out that talked about per, uh, creating perpetuals, perpetual contracts upon a price of a of the floor price of nfts which just means like the aggregate price of nfts all of a sudden we can now make uh perpetual contracts based off of nf any nft like set anything that has sufficient amount of li liquidity in the last two weeks we have seen a thousand nft projects like blossom and it just just created out of thin air over the last two weeks and i actually kind of think like over the next year we're going to see like ten thousand more and that means that there's going to be like room for like tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of perpetual contracts, synthetic assets, derivatives that are all coming out of NFTs. And that's not even talking about the DeFi tokens, which also have these same uh, potential properties. And so like, I see a world of 10,000 synthetic assets, 10,000 like derivative contracts coming into, into DeFi. And so like, is the CFTC equipped to handle just a Cambrian explosion of assets that kind of fall under the purview of commodities? No, no. And, and I, and, and look, I mean, I, I don't think that it needs to be concerned about that. Hmm. You know, even if it, you know, technically implicates its jurisdiction, you know, the, the agency has very important authorities over, you know, critical components of, of the economy that it doesn't need to be using its scarce resources to, you know, go after, you know, a, a new blossoming space, you know, that, that could implicate its, you know, potential jurisdiction. But let me answer that also in a different way, which is that I had said before, the CFTC has uh, anti-fraud and anti-manipulation authority over spot commodity transactions. You know, not, not some overarching trading registration regime you know, regulatory regime, but pure anti-fraud, anti-manipulation, um, you know, civil authority, you know, to prosecute. You know, if the agency is considering getting involved in the DeFi space at all, 
maybe it should start there. I mean, technically, that would mean that the agency has some level of prosecutorial authority over flash loan attacks, mm -hmm. for instance, mm -hmm. you know, uh, over outright fraud and theft through, you know, um, you know, chat room schemes. Um, and, you know, if, if there aren't um, criminal authorities that are helping to prosecute that activity, and if the agency is starting to dip its toe into the DeFi waters, you know, let's actually just go after the bad actors who are stealing things. Oh my God. Can, I, can I just, can I just put my hand up and say, that's exactly what we want. That's exactly yeah. what crypto wants. I mean, there are bad actors. There are uh, people who perpetuate fraud. I mean, I don't, not a day goes by that I don't get a DM or somebody on discord message me and um, try to get me to do something in crypto that's essentially going to steal all of my money, right? Um, th these are the kind of bad actors that uh, we would hope our regulators would help us with, the clear frauds, right? Um, the the bit connects of the world. I mean, good job SEC for going after that, that case, right? Or I I if there's a centralized exchange that is um, defrauding their customers, like, please help with that. Um, what what we worry about, I guess, Brian, is um, yeah, the editor for Bankless, we have a newsletter too. And um, you know, we try to go to uh, various products in the US. One of my favorite products is a DY, uh, it's called DYDX, doing really cool things. It's a Perpetuals products, product. It's not available if you live in the US, right? So it's like geo-blocked. If you live in the US, you can't access it. And I'm, I'm like, Lucas, why can't I access this? And he's like, he always goes, because we live in a financial prison, Ryan. That's why, <laughs> right? And He's kind of joking, but like it also. No, he's referring to the, he's referring to the CFTC's authorities and the statute stinks. that exists. So if I'm yeah. in Europe, I get access to these markets and these products. If I'm and, in another place, and like and why I, can't well, Americans have you know, this? And the DYDX, and I, by and, the way, and I'm not. Yeah, I, I'm just. And gonna, I'm not. Like, and I'm. The, I think the regulatory environment in Europe is different. I think it's changing. It could be changing very rapidly, and. You know, sometimes, you know, uh, a lack of clarity could be better than clarity and we'll see how it evolves in Europe um, because, you know, the clarity may not be as uh, beneficial as, you know, anyone could hope. But what I just worry about is like, uh, can it, can it, is there the real case that America could fall behind? We have some of the, the like the best talent in this space. Uh, Silicon Valley uh, came, you know, yeah. from the U.S. That's a U.S. creation. And like how can uh, government, U.S. government, not lose sight of, let's not mix, miss the next internet, guys. This is like a financial, this is a really huge uh, movement. We want it, don't, doesn't the U.S. government want it to be centered here? Don't they want their citizens to have access to this? And I worry that we're, we're missing something along the way. And this is not a criticism on, on you in particular. Like, no, no, I, I, first of all, I, I never mind being criticized. You know, I believe that, uh, you know, in my prior role, accountability is part of the job and that can come through criticism, feedback, whatever. Um, so, you know, I, I, um, I appreciate any and all of that at, at all points, um, as I hope my colleagues do. And I think they do. Um, but I, I wanted to bring up two issues that you raised. One was kind of the geofencing. Um, you know, I, I believe it's a disgrace that regulators are, are forcing through a potential enforcement action you know, entities to take away what, in my view, is a First Amendment right to privacy of market participants, you know, in our country. You know, we, we talked about balance and the pendulum. And I understand that there are ways to get around rules and get around regulations. Um, you know, but to me, there is a very strong First Amendment argument to be made to the ability to use, you know, um, VPNs and 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 access points that are you know less traceable to the government. Maybe I don't know that much about VPNs, but a lot of the conversation from a regulatory basis has been around um, detecting those uses and trying to prevent those, that from you know those kinds of access points. And, and I and I don't I don't view that positively. You know I, I think that 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 an exchange or an entity can meet its obligations by having reasonable standards in place that doesn't necessarily preclude people from exercising some right to privacy. And it's the government's job to find those things out, not to force you know, other entities to do its work for them. 
And we've, we've gotten to a point in the regulatory state where, you know, regulators are forcing entities to do a lot of their own work. And I don't view that necessarily positively uh, for freedom or for, um, you know, the, uh, the, the standards of privacy of the individual consumer. And that conversation can go directly into big tech if you wanted to, but I mean, we, don't, we won't go there today. The issue to me is still around, you know, the ability to transact freely in the financial marketplace. And it's regulators' job to try to understand what's going on, whether or not frameworks can apply, and if they aren't, how they can be. So, you know, that, that's, that's, one of, that's one of my points of view there. You talked about, um, you know, innovation and entrepreneurialism and wealth creation. Um, and, you know, it, it, in my view, one of the fascinating things about DeFi in its true form is that it is the ultimate, and it, you know, maybe in my view, the ultimate expression of the beneficial power of a free market from a... Um, access, innovation, uh, transparency, comp you know, reward, competition, virtuous cycle. Um, you know, you don't have a lot of that, uh, a lot of those characteristics in the existing financial system. Um, you know, it's hard to compete against the incumbent, you know, top 50 banks, let alone top three, right? It's hard to compete against the the top three derivatives exchanges. It's hard to compete against the top two or three stock exchanges. Um, but here we have an environment where, you know, things can be innovated at a very low cost by almost anybody, have instantaneous and widespread accessibility to create a network effect that generates value and wealth that then can be competed against and you know, reprovoke you know, innovation, growth, wealth, everything that we want. Um, why would we unduly inhibit that? It's beyond me. In the name of increasing a regulator's power, increasing someone's potential legacy, or in the name of you know, applying the law as it's currently written. Um, you know, again, I talked about balance, and I think ultimately things have to come back into balance. But I think, you know, DeFi needs to run as far as it can, as fast as it can to make sure that we get that pendulum swinging back more towards the middle. Well, we are running fast and we are running hard right now, Brian. And uh, as we start to bring this to a close, I uh, want to ask you a question about like projecting into the future. So you've, you've talked so much uh, during this discussion. I think one of the major themes has been kind of this balance. Uh, another theme is... Um, we, we need some more additional regulatory clarity coming like from our legislators, from, from Congress, uh, for some of these agencies too. So I, I'm wondering if you could maybe, we're in sort of a negative uh, trough, I guess. It seems like a negative regime, but, but can you tell us maybe where you think this ends up and, and paint the happier picture of how you think uh, America can move forward and other countries uh, America could be, maybe partially serve as a model for other countries, how they move forward with some sensible regulation for crypto that doesn't kill innovation, but actually supports it, clears out fraud. How do you think this is going to play out in, in maybe a, a good way? So I think, you know, again, I, I, I'll try to separate what I see in, in terms of the innovation and evolution of DeFi versus, you know, more of the well-known large market cap you know, crypto, you know, products, assets, and their trading environment. You know, I think, you know, in, in, in any, um, in, in any economic environment, you know, service providers are going to come to exist and grow in order to increase access and, uh, you know, ease, ease of use uh, of, of, of new products. And we've seen that with, you know, the growth of um, exponential growth of, you know, crypto trading venues, you know, exchanges. I think exchanges, you know, there's a sense in, in the government that the word exchange connotes, say, you know, a registration status with the government. So I kind of refer to them as, you know, crypto trading venues, but, you know, mm -hmm. people refer to them as exchanges and that's fine. Um, 
you know, highly centralized entities uh, providing a valuable service, you know, being compensated for that service, you know, outside of a, you know, more traditional uh, financial regulatory regime because they're, you know, in the spot commodity market for the most place, depending on what the SEC may or may not decide on the status of any product. Um, I do see the potential, you know, for a regulatory regime to develop around those because of their size, their scale, their customer base. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily advocate for it if one's going to be developed. I think the CFTC needs to be front and center in the conversation. There was a bill that was introduced in the last Congress called the Digital Commodity Exchange Act that would allow the CFTC to create a voluntary registration regime for spot crypto t uh, trading venues. And then through, through, through registration would basically grandfather in as non-security commodities the tokens that were being traded there or that had enough liquidity to justify, you know, commoditization, right? To, to solve a couple issues at the same time. And I think if something's going to happen, that's a good approach for a few reasons. One is that it's voluntary um, uh, so that it doesn't just force, you know, large successful, you know, service providers that have increased access to these products into something that may not fit them or may destroy value. Uh, it allows an agency that has you know, some level of expertise in the commodity markets to develop you know, a regime that should hopefully become attractive uh, enough for you know, voluntary registration. But it also creates an incentive you know, through uh, more certainty of the legal status of the products that are being traded. You know, there, there's an, you know, that, that is an approach that I, I could appreciate. And it is in the House Agriculture Committee the, ha the agriculture committees, getting back to our first conversation, are the committees of jurisdiction of the CFTC. You know, it's not the Financial Services Committee, it's the Agriculture Committee because of the history of futures contracts originating with the agricultural markets. And I would say that it's very important that those are our committees of jurisdiction because farmers have a strong voice there and it forces uh, the members of Congress sitting on those committees to pay attention to the effect that our regulations have on end users, on the people who need the products we regulate to manage and run their businesses. You know, and I think that that's a very important dynamic that, that I, I actually really appreciate. So it may sound odd, but I think there's a lot of public good there. Um, and so, so that's in the House Agriculture Committee. I don't know what the status will be of that bill going forward, but I would hope that in any discussion about you know a, a a a crypto centralized crypto trading venue registration regime that the 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 members of Congress on Capitol Hill that have jurisdiction of the CFTC are front and center in that conversation, you know moving along to to DeFi. You know I I don't think there is the bandwidth, the understanding, uh, or even the um, uh, capability possibly at this point to create or craft legislation that would be able to effectively target that space. I think we're going to have to see how, so I think it's going to be more of a regulator led uh, discussion of how any regulator wants to apply its existing authorities if it decides to take action and then against whom for what. And, you know, we may, we may see court cases develop out of that. And again, as I said, with regards to, you know, challenging any regulators, you know, decision making, hopefully, um, if, if any regulator takes a view that's too aggressive, uh, that's too broad, or that isn't well substantiated, you know, a judge ends up making, you know, a ruling on it to either um, limit, you know, or, or negate that kind of decision you know, or hear it for its merits and, and embrace it under certain circumstances, uh, you know, in that scenario. Brian, this has been absolutely fantastic uh, to, to walk um, through some of these issues with you. I re really appreciate it. I hope the Bankless Nation heard that it all starts with agriculture, all starts with farming, <laughs> is what Brian Quintes is telling us. Um, this has really been a pleasure. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Dave. It's great to be with you. Um, I w wish you all the best. And 
uh, hope to stay in touch as, as things move forward. Well, can I ask you this? You got some extra time on your hands these days. Uh, what are you going to be doing? And part of me kind of wishes you were still at the CFTC now that I've heard your, 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 uh, your voice and your values. Um, so I'm kind of regretting that, but like, what, what are you going to spend your time on? Well, th well, thanks for that, Ryan. I, I, I do appreciate that. I was going to have to leave by the end of the year anyway, and um, it, to, it was the right time to, to, to move on. Um, I don't have anything uh, lined up yet. Uh, I'm hoping to have some announcement in the next uh, few days, maybe within a week. Um, as I said in my, you know, uh, my resignation uh, uh, communication, I want to keep crypto and DeFi very relevant to my career. And I, I think you know at least one of my announcements in the near future will do that. And I'm hoping to um, do a number of things that can you know embrace you know this space, this innovation, um, and uh, the freedom and and uh, opportunity that exists in it, and help move it forward. Well, Brian, uh, as bullish as I am on crypto, I am also bull as bullish on your career and seeing what you do in this space. So uh, I'm looking forward to following that story. In the words of a great meme, we will follow your career with great interest. <laughs> yes, we will. Uh, Thank you. Nation, Thank you we hope you enjoyed that. Brian Quintez uh, joining us for this incredible conversation. Some action items for you today. A, I, I guess maybe a sister episode to this. Go tune into our episode with Hester Peirce that we did a few months ago. Uh, she is a commissioner on the SEC. That's a good reference. You get the SEC's take. Now we have sort of a, a you know former uh, CFTC commissioner's take on it. It'll round out the picture of what's going on in DC. You can also listen to the episode with Ryan Selkis we did. Also, Jake Chervinsky. Fantastic discussions there. Also, we've, been new, we've released a new show. At least David has. He's been busy on it. Coming out every Tuesday, it's called Layer Zero. This tracks the social element of crypto, the stories of individual people and what they are doing in the space. David, I think our next one, every Tuesday this comes on, mm -hmm. is the next one with um, Justin, Justin Drake. Justin Drake. Justin Drake. Yeah, last week was with Eric Connor, which was already one of my fan, uh, favorite conversations. Next week, uh, the one coming out tomorrow, from if listeners are listening to this on Monday, is with Justin Drake. So definitely do not miss that. And also... If you appreciate all the shows that we are doing and the conversations that we are having, please go ahead and give us those five-star reviews wherever you listen to podcasts. There, David fit in two action items in one. Awesome, man. All right, risks and disclaimers. Guys, crypto is risky. DeFi is risky. ETH is risky. So is Bitcoin. You could lose what you put in, but we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the bankless journey. Thanks a lot. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, head over to Bankless HQ right now to develop your crypto investing skills and learn how to free yourself from banks and gain your financial independence. We recommend joining our daily newsletter, podcast, and community as a Bankless Premium subscriber to get the most out of your Bankless experience. You'll get access to our market analysis, our alpha leaks, and exclusive content, and even the Bankless token for airdrops, raffles, and unlocks. If you're interested in crypto, the Bankless community is where you want to be. Click the link in the description to become a Bankless Premium subscriber today. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for in-depth interviews with industry leaders, Ask Me Anythings, and weekly roll-ups where we summarize the week in crypto and other fantastic content. Thanks everyone for watching and being on the journey as we build out the Bankless Nation.